Welcome to the bridge. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here this morning. Welcome. Everybody's coming in with, from getting their donuts and coffee. Beautiful morning outside today. We're glad you chose to be here with us for this time here. And uh, have, have a more beautiful day to look forward to, hopefully, coming up. Um, the call to worship this morning is just a continuation from the parable that we're going to be in today in Luke chapter 16. And it's the next verses that we won't have as part of our focal text today, but it's uh, verse 16 from Luke 16. And, and it says here, the law, this is Jesus speaking after he speaks the parable of the dishonest manager. He says, the law and the prophets were until John. John is John the Baptist or John the baptizer. It wasn't a denomination. John, that's the title he had because he baptized people. John the baptizer. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, right? That's what Jesus is saying. It's being preached. The good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. And listen to this next statement. Everyone forces his way into it. What does that mean? So as we were going through this this week, uh, this passage, that text came up for me. And it's like, what does that mean? Everybody forced their way into it. Well, we're going to have a chance. I, I get to preach this morning. I'm looking forward to unpacking that a little bit. But we've got young children in the room and uh, just children's ministry workers, all types of people here this morning. I want you to hear this. Jesus is making a statement that when the gospel is preached, people can't get enough. When the gospel is preached, you've got people coming from all directions, all different backgrounds, all different types of credos, all different types of belief systems, all different types of whatever, personalities, and they're forcing their way into it. Crowds are gathering around Jesus in this passage, and he knows this, as the kingdom of God is being preached because the gospel means good news. And guess what? We sometimes say it in ways that it don't always seem like good news. But when Jesus preached it, it was good news, talking about how God loves you, and he sent me, the Messiah, Jesus, to bring you into the kingdom of God. So people are showing up in droves to hear about it. You got people who think they're the right people to be there, and you got people who the right people look at them and go, hmm, they shouldn't be here. And that's where Jesus is making this statement. Everyone's forcing their way into it kingdom of God. They want a piece of it. And this is the next thing he says in verse 17. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. What's that supposed to mean? So here we are today and some of us think we can still earn our way to God. Jesus made the point consistently that there is no one righteous, no not one. He is the only one who can save us. And so even in this statement, right after that, about people forcing their way into the kingdom, he wants to make sure that everybody knows, you can't get there on your own. You need the master, savior, Jesus, to lead you there. And so this is all part of that, because guess who does fulfill the law and the prophets, the Old Testament? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so, guys, I say all that as a call to worship, because I've said it before. If we came in here for any other reason then to meet Jesus, we need to repent. Right now, God is calling you to meet Jesus, to find your thankfulness in him, to find your hope in him, to find everything of expectation in him. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to rise and worship with me this King Jesus. Welcome your neighbor next to you, please. Hello, Bridge family. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see everybody here. So good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to visit with our neighbor and friends. We are blessed today. If you don't know somebody who's next to you, make sure you say hi to them and introduce yourself. We're excited to worship Blessed Assurance. Oh, what a poor taste, a 
Thou fount of every blessing. 
This time we'll dismiss our children. And as they're leaving, I will lead us in prayer. God, we are so prone, prone to wander. We're so tempted to leave you when things are hard. God, I thank you that when you are faithless, you remain faithful. And when we are at the end of our rope, at the end of that line, we can find you there. God, I pray that you will just turn our hearts, turn our eyes to you this morning. Please help our children to be from your word, help them to be excited about you. Um, I pray that the things they learn in class today will change them and that they can apply it to their, their Monday and their Tuesday and their weekend and that their lives will be changed because you are in them and changing them. I thank you for the teachers and their willingness to serve. God, I pray as we continue to worship you in the gathering that our hearts will be tender towards your word and please change us forward as we worship you together. I love this next um, worship song, Abide, and I love how it says, teach me to abide. Um, at the beautiful age of 51, I'm still finding out that I am still learning and that God still has so much to teach me. Every, every week, I'm like, really? 
I haven't learned that yet. So in order for me to learn that, I have to abide in him. Um, and when you abide in him, he's going to show you, he's going to refine you, he's going to correct you, he's going to help you. Um, because we depend on him for everything that we need. Our, our flesh is our flesh, but our spirit is what we need to, to help us to work through our problems, help us to understand who we are, to help us understand who he is. So we just thank for this morning that God, for hopefully for all of us, is still teaching us how to abide in him. Yes, I do. 
prayer together. God, would you help us to, to be what we, what we just sang and prayed, that we depend on you. God, we are so self-reliant, so independent, so thinking that we have it all together, that we have our own strength, our own power, our own ability to, to live and, and do whatever it might be. God, help us to repent to that. Help us to depend on you. Teach us to abide in you, as we say. Teach us to, to just want to be close to you, want to be drawing from you as a branch draws from the vine. Help us to do this, Father. Help us to do this daily, hourly. Help us to repent of our own independence and self-reliance. We pray that you would, you would be here, as you already are here. We pray you continue to be here. God, be here and work in our hearts, work in our hearts as your word is open. Help us to see our sin, help us to repent of that sin, help us to see your beauty and majesty and glory and glory of Jesus and what he has done. As we feel joy and worship and thankfulness, we have that. Pray all this for your glory and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I thank God for the way he works through the church and works through the people. We prayed this morning, uh, just the joy of being able to be a part of the team and not come into these things and feel like you're the only one. And Jesus had a team uh, when he walked on this earth, right? He's got a team right now, his body, the body of Christ. But when he walked on this earth, he had those disciples who were with him and um, Jesus found consolation through their company as well. Let us never forget that Jesus longed for those relationships as much as he saw mission and purpose in, um, in, in teaching into them and helping them along the way. And so as I mentioned in the call to worship, you see with Jesus' ministry many crowds that are starting to gather around him. And in those crowds, you had all, di all different types of people. But one thing that Jesus always kept and continues to keep as the focus for his followers is that we aren't just teaching things into the air. We're not just teaching the Bible. And I've used this in talking to community group leaders over the years, and then uh, we'll continue to just teach people small group ministry that we don't teach the Bible primarily. We teach people, and we're teaching people about what the Bible says. And just keeping that mindset helps us to remember that we're, we're called to connect in some way with the audience that we're talking to, and we have to keep in mind if they're even hearing us anymore, if I just keep sputtering ideas up here, at some point that's just futile and it's really not serving a purpose. So um, I want you to know that God is still teaching people, and if you're here today to receive this word, he's teaching you. He loves you and wants you to hear these words. Um, he loves me, wants me to hear these words, even as I get to speak and give some commentary on these things from the pulpit preaching experience, but God is speaking to each one of us. And as there was crowds gathering around Jesus during that time in his ministry, as we're in the parables of Jesus, you had all these people who were gathering around him. And if you, so my wife is a reading specialist. She's back with the kids today, but she got her master's degree in reading as a reading specialist. And I remember her with our kids just emphasizing over and over through the years, context clues are important context clues when you read. And you've heard me talk about context a lot, but I'm glad that she would reemphasize those things with my children in their general reading. Because when you read the Bible, it's important for us to look for context clues. So as we read parables like today, it can be a bit confusing if we don't, and it can be confusing no matter what, but it's important to look at the context around it, like the call to worship text. Those verses follow what Jesus is going to say in this text. And so those things help us start to Look at what Jesus is talking about. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about some parables that deal with wasting the things that God gives us, right? We had the, the story that I, I preached a few weeks ago about the rich fool, right? I was the guy that was asked to talk about the rich fool. And so we laughed about that, right? But I was in that parable. We see a man who's wasted his possessions, has much, but doesn't use it for God, uses it for own self-gain or self-interest, and is taken prematurely to, to heaven, and all that is just passed on. He, didn't, he wasted his time with that. Then we had last week the prodigal son who asked for a partial uh, inheritance from his father and then takes that, squanders it, wastes it as well. And so you see this, this 
pattern of wasting that we're going to continue to see in, in the parable today. But the reason I want you to hear this is because context is important. Who is Jesus speaking to with these parables? Obviously, he's speaking to us today because his word is eternal and it has an effect on us today. But there was actually an audience that was at Jesus' feet for these parables that was in his proximity to hear these things being taught. And we're told in the context of these passages that there was these crowds gathering around. We're told there were tax collectors. Now, for us, we're like tax collectors. I'm going to have to be contacting a tax collector soon, right, and file my tax returns and figure that out, whether it's an AI tax collector or a human tax collector. I don't know. But one way or another, I need help, and somebody's going to help me pay my tax returns. But file my tax returns. But in that time when they heard tax collector, wasn't maybe like me who's thinking maybe I'll get a refund this year or something like that. These tax collectors were known to be shy stream people out of money and they were skimming off the top. And so when you heard the term tax collector in Jesus' day as a Jewish um, person like Jesus was, that term was not like that wasn't what you wanted to hear your son say he was going to grow up and be. That wasn't what you wanted to hear your daughter say she's going to grow up and be. Okay, so this was a term of contempt. And so when these people are gathering around Jesus, it shows that here's some people who aren't popular in the crowd. But for some reason, they're going to come into the crowd to hear this man. And I gave a little preface to that in the call to worship. There's some good news they're looking for. And Jesus is attracting that type of demographic into his ministry. So tax collectors. It's also referring to people that are sinners, and that term would be used so often, tax collectors and sinners, that I think we sometimes just, you know, we, we get those just. But it, it's, it's anybody of that sort that would be despised by the general religious crowd or the faithful Jews, right? So even Jesus' own group of disciples were fishermen. Not, not really the ones that would be like in the crowd like, oh, fellas, hey, VIP section, let's get you up here. You're the fishermen that follow Jesus. We want you up close. They would even be looked on by the Pharisees and scribes as less than, and what do they have? Like, what's their role here? And I want you to hear that. And some of you, your mind just went to fishing, and I know it's a nice day, but please come back. <laughs> be a good steward of this time and let God speak to you in this moment, because it's important to hear these words for all of us, because it's really this parable about the dishonest manager is for us to think about how we're managing the resources that God's given us, and for what purpose? We're going to answer that today. God's still speaking to us about that today. So this is the context that, that Jesus is in as we go into this passage. So let's look there at Luke chapter 16, and uh, verses 1 through 15, and I'm going to read all of them. Try to stay with me again. Get your mind right. Let's be here, here in this passage. It might be a little confusing uh, as we go. I will just go ahead and preface. He tells the parable. In this crowd, we don't know if he's speaking to the Pharisees or to his disciples directly, like turned and then telling them this parable. But we do know that the, we don't read that. Or yeah, we do read that in here, that the Pharisees come back and ridicule Jesus for what he's teaching. So I think they're somehow hearing this, being privy to what he's saying here. Um, whether the whole crowd hears it or just his disciples, it's for everybody. So as we hear that, you're going to hear the parable. And then that's a little bit maybe confusing, but just stay with me. And we're going to see what kind of conclusions I believe as Christians we should draw from that. Asking the spirit that Eddie talked about this morning to enlighten us to that understanding. Because we don't want to come to the scripture with our own preconceived notion of what God has to say. And that so often gets in the way, doesn't it? And the Pharisees and scribes approach Jesus so often in his day with preconceived notions of what he should be saying. And you know, I don't want to, I want you to hear this. There were Pharisees and scribes who came to saving faith in Jesus Christ during his day. So please understand that the miracle of God can work on the tax collector, work on the worst, the chief of sinners despised in that society in that time. And the Pharisees and scribes, it can work on you and me. No matter what spectrum, part of that spectrum of faith or, dis, or dis, disbelief you are on, God can work the miracle of regenerating our heart to believe in Jesus Christ and to have that saving faith in him. 
And that's the power, the miracle we're all praying for. So as we go through this, there's a parable, and this is what I want to get to. Then Jesus is going to give us a discourse in verses 9 and what follows to help explain his heart, what he is saying through this parable. So you would be a bad manager of this text if you just went to somebody and read verses 1 through 8 and stopped there, I believe. Maybe, maybe if you got 1 through 8, you're good, but don't stop at 1 through 7. Because there's a point that Jesus is trying to make with this parable, and it's not the parable in and of itself. It's the heart of Jesus Christ. And that's going to be revealed in the last part. So I just want to preface this reading with that so that you can follow along and look forward to what Jesus is going to say. So here we go. The reading of the word of the Lord in verse 1 there in chapter 16. He, Jesus, also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? Notice his response here, his thoughts. I am not strong enough to dig And I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his own shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. And before I forget to say it, I just want to stop there real quick in verse 9, because I think that is like kind of ties all of this together, and the point that I really believe the conclusion Jesus is bringing us to here, um, and amplifies from the following verses. Verse 9, he says something about unrighteous wealth. And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, well, that has nothing to do with me then if I'm in Christ, right? That's a mis- misunderstanding of the translation here if we think like that. Unrighteous wealth, I have unrighteous wealth. Un- you have unrighteous wealth. These people had unrighteous wealth. And then what it means, is it's worldly wealth. It means wealth that's not eternal riches, right? It's the resources of this world, which for us is hard to understand because we're like, well, if that's, and you don't, don't get too far off in your head. Just worldly wealth is how I'd ask you to think about that so that you can understand the context of what Jesus is saying here. And it's been translated in other places as worldly wealth. Easier for me to understand. So verse 9, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves. I'm going to replace that by means of worldly wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Verse 10, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If, you then, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth or worldly wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? What's true riches? Stop there. True riches, eternal. Eternal. Just, just the eternal because that's God, right? So eternal things. Verse 12. And if you have not been fruit, faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Some some translations there in verse 13 at the end of that one says money. And some translations, you might have heard this quoted back to you. Me as a kid, it would have said you cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon was the Greek term for possessions or wealth. So money is a good term. Just help us again expand that to possessions and wealth because it's to me it's so much that Jesus is talking about. Verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. 
And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for teaching. Thank you for teaching us, your children, what, what it is that you, you long for, what it is that you yearn for. When we say glory, what is it that you mean? And God, thank you for moments like this where it's not so easy to explain, but you make us wrestle with the teachings that you give so that we will turn our eyes to you for the answers. Continue to lead us through your voice, through your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So that was one of the things I just prayed, right, is that we would see these things through the light of Christ who helps us to understand. If we have approached these parables in a healthy way, praise be to God. But if we have approached these parables as things that will teach us ways to deal morally with the world, shame on us. Now, see, that's not something that most people would, would amen because they would say, wait a second, a moral thing is a good thing. Not if the moral thing replaces following Jesus Christ. And so I would just say this, if your faith is based on morality first, you're missing the mark. Our faith is based on Jesus Christ who shows us what the right things are. And the right things will fit with the moral values of God. It's not going to contradict us. So don't get it twisted. Don't think I'm trying to lead us in a different direction or that Jesus is somehow some weird cult leader. God is, from the beginning, has been working on this plan through the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to reveal to the nations, to reveal to all creation what his plan of redemption is, but then also to show how it's going to be fulfilled. And it was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And you and I are the benefactors today. You know what's kind of wild about this whole thing as we get into this passage too, and I've been praying and doing a lot of soul searching this, is we as human beings want something right now. Like, hey, God, if it's going to take generations, that's too long because I'm here today. So it needs to happen through me. It needs to happen in me. It needs to happen for me. That's not the way that we should pray. Jesus himself, the kids are talking today about the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you know what that means for Jesus? Not my will, but yours be done. He's on earth. Jesus, our master, the one who teaches these parables. And he's having to pray, not my will, but yours be done. Because he wanted that cup. If there was any other way, take that cup from me. But his heart was aligned with God. You will lead me to the thing that you want in this. You will help me in this to do this. In his humanness, in his human spirit, he needed the power of God's spirit to guide him and lead him in that moment of facing crucifixion. And so many other things. They're going to talk about betrayal in there, right? There's so many things that Jesus went through even before the physical pain. And I'm saying that because, guys, Jesus understood that it wasn't about right now, this moment, for me. Jesus understood that this was building on generations. And it would be built on generations going forward. And, guys, we get so confused. But even the verses I read in the call to worship, we need to remember that God is the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. And if it started with him, it's ending with him. Nothing's changing, just the way that we're able to see the revelation unfold. One day, there'll be no, you know, viewing it dimly, right? One day, we'll be seeing it fully clear in the presence of God. And none of this will be confusing in any way. Because even as I explain it, there's going to be something where you'll be like, well, let me clarify, right? But when we stand in the full presence of God, everything is revealed in its fullness. But I say all that to say, we want it right now, and I want to say this before I get into management and how we manage our resources. Jesus uses transitional language his whole ministry. And he uses transitional language all through the Bible. Why? Because this life is not all that we were made for. The parables are all about revealing what the transition looks like to the kingdom of God. We get confused thinking the kingdom of God is glory by and by after this life. The kingdom of God is this. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God was when Jesus stepped onto the planet 
And John announced, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he said, repent. Before that, he was saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus steps on the planet. The kingdom of God is here. Why is the kingdom of God here? Because the king showed up. And so the king is in the room. The king is in the world. The king is in the universe. And he's already declared his stake on all creation. And now we're just living in it. And we're knowing it and experiencing it and and experiencing that love and then called to share that love with others. So I say all that to say, don't get confused to not associate the law and the prophets with Jesus. The law and the prophets was to point to who Jesus the king was. And we have that affirmation and confirmation today. If you haven't studied it, you should study it. If you haven't reached a, a verdict, that place of the evidence that demands a verdict, right? If you haven't reached that on your own, then get there. Don't, don't take my word for it. Search this out so that you can know that you know that you know in this life that Jesus is the one. Either Lord, liar, or lunatic, and you can settle on which one. But you shouldn't be walking around taking my word for it or Stephen or anybody else in this church. You should know that because you've been assured by the full counsel of God's word and by the testimony of his spirit and your own prayer life your circumstances, and the way that God's working. Those things should be affirming this truth about Jesus. That builds us an anchor of hope that is sure and secure, and the storms of life will not overcome it. So one of the questions that comes up here is, how can this master commend this dishonest manager in verse 8 for his shrewdness here? Because he's been dishonest, right? He's been dishonest. And so this is where I would try to say, it's, this came to me. I, I've been praying about it. I'm going to be honest. I was praying about, like, what does that illustration look like throughout the night, throughout the night? And this one came to me as, like, this was an example of shrewdness that was taught in my life. And it's a good, I think it's a good value. It's not anything that's preachable to say you should do it this way. But it's shrewdness, and it helps, modif- helps me to understand where shrewdness is good. But I think it misses the mark. If this is the point that we take home, yes, I need to be more shrewd in everything. My dad, who's no longer with us, he's in heaven with God, enjoying, enjoying eternity in its fullness. My dad, whenever he was in college, at, uh, he started college at 17, turned 18, I think, in November. But by the time he was 18, had started his freshman first semester, went to play football at Milliken. All he did, he says, I didn't go to class, I just drove around my Mustang, you know, and doing his thing, playing football, and he flunked out. He was out of school the next semester. I heard that my whole life. My dad, later on, that, he, he tells me this story, later on went back, joined the Army, married, married my mom, joined the Army, went to uh, Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee, where I was born. He ends up getting his degree, and then later gets his uh, master's in uh, Kansas City at Midwest Baptist Theological Seminary, where I also lived as a kid. And so we had that experience where dad talks about, hmm, a little different when I was paying for it, a little different. And so with my kids growing up, we talked about, because when he was going to milk and he wasn't paying for it, and my grandpa was paying for it, and he was the baby of the family, my dad, so you can imagine. 14 kids, and he's the baby of the family. I'm sure my grandpa was writing a blank check. I know how it is with my baby. But at the same time, I'm going to tell you what he's heard his whole life, and what Andy heard, my children, was, hey, your mom and dad aren't going to pay for your college. And it wasn't, and we tried to explain, it wasn't about because we can't, or we couldn't put away, or we won't figure that out. It was like, this just puts the onus on you to be thinking about how that money's spent. And so when you go to class, I hope it's because you put your penny down on it, right? So you're going to go, and now it's not a penny anymore, guys. It's a lot of money. <laughs> so that's why Dre's like, Lewis and Clark, baby. <laughs> and that's the part most people don't know is like, these things start to play into their shrewdness to figure out how's that going to look, because we've got to pay for these things. And so, not right or wrong. You can do it however you want. But I think that's a shrewd thing that God blessed me with in my family and my life. What I'm trying to say is if that's what we see here is like, yep, I need to just start becoming more shrewd in life. And as Christians, we should be more shrewd and and just do these things. And because John said that, maybe you think you should do that. That's not the point. That is, If that's all that Jesus was teaching here, maybe we need a weekend seminar and we're good for the rest of our life. I don't know. But I know what Jesus' teaching here requires me to daily, what we just sang, I depend on you, I depend on you, I depend on you. 
So what Jesus is teaching here is bigger than shrewdness about financial decisions only and Right, So I want to say that because we're talking today about being good managers of what God's entrusted to us. Guys, what he has entrusted to us is more than just money, but that's a big part of how his, his devotion shows in our life. How we spend our money, how we use our physical resources. When we looked at the rich fool, when we looked at the prodigal son, when we looked at this manager in this parable, we see that each is wasting that worldly wealth. They're not using it in ways that... Jesus would say we should use it. So how does Jesus say it? There it is, verse 9. There it is, verse 9. He's not teaching shrewdness in and of itself. Do you understand what I mean? He's teaching something bigger, shrewdness that is used in taking what you've been entrusted with today and using what you have to build relational capital for the kingdom of God. And I'm reading it that way because it's so helpful for me this week to, in both groups that I was a part of, to have that pulled out, verse 9, where in verse 9 he says, and I tell you, Jesus makes a point to say, and I tell you, if Jesus makes a point to say, and I tell you, listen, it's probably a good idea to take those things most, like take them to heart. And what does he say next? Make friends for yourself by means of worldly wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. That was awesome. Because as I read that passage and things began to be enlightened in my mind to understand this in context, it was Jesus is actually giving us an invitation to actually use the things that God has given us in this life to win relational rapport with other people for the king. And when we do that, guess what will happen in heaven? You will get to see some of them. And you will actually be walking. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. We've got people who are worried if it's big enough for all the people. <laughs> you don't know how big that is. You haven't trusted. You don't need to worry about that. But I do know this. Jesus actually said something that tells me I'm going to see some people in heaven who have been impacted by how I've used my worldly wealth. How I've used my possessions to advance his kingdom, right? Right? Don't take this verse as like, hey, you use your wealth so that you can get into heaven. That is not what he just said. He said, make friends. I'm going to read it again. Make friends by yourself, for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, what fails? The unrighteous wealth, the worldly wealth. What, how does it fail? It, it diminishes. It no longer has value. It, it ceases to be important when I, this heart stops beating, right? There's no more importance to that wealth. In that moment, I take my last breath. For me, it cannot do anything. And Jesus knows that. He's using transitional language. He's preparing us for what's to come. And so he's doing that now. And he says, hey, so use that instead. Let me read the rest. So that when it fails, they, who's they? The friends you just made in this life. How'd you make them? Through, un through unworldly wealth. I mean, through worldly wealth, right? Unrighteous wealth. And then he goes on to say, this is what's awesome. So that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Man, I don't know what kind. I think I said in my last sermon, man, I hope you ain't caught up on a mansion in heaven. But get caught up on, hey, I'm going to be able to see those friends that God has made through the kingdom being advanced in my life into their life. I'm going to be able to see them in heaven one day in our eternal dwellings. And I don't know what your place is going to look like. I don't know what my place is going to look like. But we're going to get to welcome each other in. You can look forward to that. We always think it's going to be so different. I don't know what it's going to be like. I just know it's going to be perfect and redeemed. And, and there's nothing broken in it. So it won't look like this life where there's the foreboding joy of what, when's, another shoe going to, when's the next shoe going to drop. When is the next thing going to happen in this broken world? This week has been full of disappointment, full of tragedy, full of despair for all the community. It's been like that for months on end, right? It continues to move that way. That's what the world sees. Christians, we're called to see that and then say, and there's transitional language. This is not all that we're made for. Let these things build our faith even stronger in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's full of truth, full of grace, who has power for right now to help us sustain through this moment of despair, to give us gratitude and hope to look forward to what's to come. And it helps us now to live in a way that our light still shines before men and our love still is expressed towards others. And it's not just for this room. It's to bleed out into the community. 
This is a powerful thing that Jesus is teaching here, and it's not about just financial shrewdness. It might be for you at different points along the way, but it's bigger than that. If it's about a shrewdness that says, I'm going to take seriously using everything I have, all material possessions, all my wealth. God, it's yours. So help me through your Holy Spirit. Lead me through your word and through the fellowship with the saints to know how to use that in a way Sometimes in conjunction with others, sometimes it's as individuals, whatever that looks like. But to use that in a way that I'm making friends for the king so that one day we can enjoy his kingdom together without all this mess. One thing I notice in this human nature, divine nature struggle that Jesus is teaching the divine nature and what God really longs for is that people are loved, right? People are the focus. Is that in our human nature, in our unlimited, I'm sorry, in our human nature, the limited resources. Just like me a few weeks ago saying, I look at those birds on the tree and immediately start thinking, how could they, is there enough? How are they going to be able to, they should have took more. That's my human nature, thinking about the limited resources and how am I going to provide for us, for this. For... And you know what God's word keeps coming back to? The master has unlimited resources. You're only seeing worldly. You're not seeing eternal. You're not looking at it through transitional lens. So I said in that last sermon, this is for the down and out. This is for the well-to-do and all between. It's still the same today. This is for the Pharisee, the tax collector, the sinner, everybody in between. And if you and I don't hear this message, we miss out because God's chief concern still is people. And he's got unlimited resources behind himself to help us win them to himself. And guys, I said something early on. I can't really, I mean, I got some money in my wallet, but not enough to really like pay you off for Jesus, I guess. <laughs> I know that's not true because he's given everything. He's given everything, and we still struggle. We still sing prone to wonder, right? And we know it. We feel it. I got some money, but it's not going to win you over to Jesus. But what I said earlier is something I can give you, and you can give to each other. What was it? that uh, Was it Peter or Paul? I think it was Peter who said, silver or gold, have we not? But what we do have, and they gave healing. Now, I'm not saying I'm here to do like some physical healings today, but I am trying to tell you that I know the one who can. I'm sitting here today trying to tell you that I know the one who has that power in your life to heal you ultimately of what's most important. Don't get short-sighted. Don't get, don't lose focus. If the parables lead us to start to say, I want to make sense and figure out wisdom on life, okay, a lot of people are going to hang around with you, I know. But I want to hang around with you and have you speaking to me and my children who are adults now and into my family and my people under my tutelage if you're a person who says, when I read the parables, it makes me want to know more what Jesus has to say and what they mean. That I want to know more about who Jesus is and what he stands for, what he believes, because then we get to the heart of God. And guys, that's what this is all leading us to. Right things and wrong things. The wrong things are anything that's leading us away from Jesus, and he is our only source to know what God wants from us and for us. So the Pharisees, uh, in, in a group on Thursday night, uh, Todd, I think, had said that they had become seasoned experts in how to make money. I think that was a term that was used. Maybe that was a term for lovers of money from the message, maybe. I'm not sure, but that, that phrase came up in my head, and I wrote it in my notes, seasoned, becoming seasoned experts at making money, and it helped me get my head around what I don't want to be, right? I, let me say that different. There's nothing wrong with being a seasoned expert in making money. There is nothing wrong with that. But if that starts to move ahead of your devotion to God, it's out of whack, right? God, God has equipped some of you to be seasoned experts at making money, and God willing, you continue to do that. Um, I don't know that I am. But I will say this. We all are being given things that are like worldly possessions and wealth. And here's what I want to point about that. The Pharisees have gotten really good at how to parse this part's God's, this part's mine. This part's God's, this part's mine. Guys, I do it. You do it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. There's people looking at me right now. I'm going to tell you right now. In this room, there are some of you that think, that's based on a percentage. 
And it's been said to you over and over, it's all of it. So I'm telling you, the Pharisees felt good because they gave that percentage. And that's the wrong spirit. The right spirit is I can never give enough. I can never give enough. But it's all yours, God. It's all available. And that lesson was taught to me years ago, and I'm so thankful for that. And it keeps me knowing I'm dependent on the grace of God in these things. But the Pharisees are these people who had become seasoned experts in, in how to make money. And I wrote this down. There was a sense of urgency in this dishonest manager. If you notice in verse 6, it says that he says, sit down quickly and change your amount. Right? There was a sense of urgency. What Jesus is calling out is a sense of urgency. We have a sense of urgency for the wrong things. What am I urgent about this morning right here, right now? I can tell you my heart is urgent about the kingdom of God. I don't know in two hours from now where that sense of urgency will start to fall. Will it be lunch? Will it be, well, we're not that far from lunch, are we? Hopefully not. There's a sense of urgency to get this sermon done. There's a sense of urgency. Is that the only amen I'm going to get? Come on, man. <laughs> no. But there's a sense of urgency about certain things that come up that aren't the things that Jesus is urging about, right? In our lives, the human nature. And the divine nature helps us to see the urgency is about making friends for the king. If you already are a friend, if you're not a friend yet, then you know what God's urgency is? That you become his friend. How's he do that? Through Jesus. So know that. He's starting with you. He's starting with me. And then what we know about him is what we get to share with others. So he is urgent about that, just like this dishonest manager was urgent about figuring out how he was going to have a place to stay. So I want you to understand, it's not the sense of urgency that's wrong, it's how it's misplaced, that we misplace it into worldly things. And I wrote down a statement that I actually heard in a movie this week. People are so busy trying to make a living. Can you relate to that? So busy being seasoned experts in making money. So busy trying to make a living. I work two jobs. There's so much going on. Sometimes I actually was, I, I didn't want to share this, but I'm going to say it. Wednesday morning, I was like, I felt stupid because a man 40 years old in the fire service died and they were having his visitation the night before. But for, and then another person in the community, just so many things. And I'm like, I feel so stupid to say I feel overwhelmed. But in the shower that morning, I'm like, I feel overwhelmed. And I said, God, I need that you help me to know how to manage these things. And we're talking about managing life, resources. This is just as apropos to me as it is to any of you. And all of us can feel overwhelmed at times. And here's what I want you to hear. We can be people so busy trying to make a living. Hey, got to pay the bills, right? So busy trying to make a living that we've forgotten how to live. It's just such a simple phrase, but I think that's what Jesus is getting to here in the heart of this. Don't be so busy trying to make a living, hold your living, secure your living, that you forget how to live. Transitional language. Because this life is not all that they're here for. You were made for more. You were made for me, Jesus says. Start there. The word abide was used over and over. That is therapeutic language. That is spiritual nourishment. Abide in Jesus. We are the branches. He is the vine. Our life source comes from him. Guys, if at the end of that prayer on Wednesday morning was, yeah, I'm overwhelmed and screw it. That's not how that prayer ended. I was no sooner out of the shower, wiped myself off of that towel. And I was like feeling Jesus empowering me for what he's called me to do. And knowing that I'm not alone in that. Bringing some of those things to mind to say, I brought them through. I'm bringing them through. You're praying for these people. I'm going to carry you. And it was more of that, yeah, John, I got you. Yeah, John, I got you. Which you guys know if that's real in my life. Because you see that in the groups you're with me. You see that in my life. You see that in my wife sitting next to me. You see that in my son here today. You see that in him serving communion today. You see that in my daughter serving in children's ministry the week after she got engaged. You see these things in many different ways and I just want to make that clear. Get to know the people who you are putting your trust in. If it's some TV personality, beware. Jesus walked. He dwelt among these people. 
Pastor Stephen and I, we share times and moments with you so you can see into our lives. You get to speak into us. You get to see how we handle correction. And I'm not saying that to say that from a place of pride. I'm saying that like that's been a place of accountability in my life by the grace of God. And so when I share that, you know whether I'm blowing smoke about Wednesday morning or if I'm telling you something that is actually the life source in my life. Because I'm standing here today pretty passionate about this stuff. And it's because I've seen him work through this stuff. The word of God is eternal. Everything else fades. The word of God is eternal. And guess what he said about his word for his people? His word is implanted in us. So what does that say about us? Eternal. What's of importance to God? People. Whatever we make it about today, don't be so busy living, trying to make a living that you forget how to live. Jesus said how to live not in our limited resources, not in the law of diminishing returns as things just keep getting like, hey, I'm getting to the end of my years. That's not how we live. Ours is transitional. Ours is whatever day, whatever point along the way, this is just the beginning of the rest of my life. This is the beginning of my time with Jesus in eternity to come, starting now. And it's a transitional language that he wants us to, whatever we do, whether it's eat, drink, or whatever, do it all for the glory of God. Build relational capital for the king. And that's the invitation for you and I today. That's what God invites us to through Jesus Christ, is that we would take anything we have, anything we do, and we would say, God, help me to do it for your glory. And how can we do that? Only by Jesus leading us. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So many hear that and only think it means I'm going to heaven someday. If you don't know what that means for today, you got some praying to do. You got some reading of his word and spending time with people to understand. The way, the truth, and the life is for now and for then and for then. Man, it is rich. It's really about an abundant life, right? It's about what God wants to do. Whether we have a lot or a little, it's about an abundant life. So that's the invitation today, guys. Don't live in your limited resources. Use your limited resources for the glory of God. Everyone here in this room today is invited to do that, from young to old. Because guess what? Even the youngest person, I don't know who the youngest person is in this room. But I'll just use Will. I'll pick on Will. Here he is. There you go. He don't mind. (laughs) Even Will Bland has been given worldly wealth, possessions that God wants him to use to advance the kingdom of God, to make friends for the king. And I know that looks different at each stage of our life. And I know that's what you guys are hearing, and that's what Jesus wants to be said the oldest person in the room, and I'd almost say the most feeble or the person, and we're not going to ask them to raise their hand, but I would say (laughs) the person who feels like they got nothing much to give physically. You still have things that God has entrusted you with. I remember some of the dear saints that have already passed on from our church, and when we would sit and talk about, I know you're in this position, you can't leave this house or you can't leave this bed, but you can pray. And here's some people that we need to pray for. And they prayed earnestly for you and me. That's a powerful thing. That's the thing that changed my life on Wednesday morning, prayer. That's what they're doing for you. I'm not the only one praying for me. God has you praying for me. (laughs) These are powerful things. So you have limited resources, but use them for the glory of God. And here's what I want to say ultimately. That's the invitation for all of us, then to trust the unlimited resources of God to save us in this life. That's our security, okay? That's our security, and we have that through Jesus. So I'm going to lead into another moment of response and invitation, It always takes me so long on the weeks of communion to lead into this. But it's my most excited part for me in the service. And here's why. Because this is the commendation from God. This is where God says it is finished through Jesus. And I'm not asking the guys to come up yet. I just want to point to these elements. It's God saying through these things. There's nothing, I don't believe, there's anything magical about this plate of bread or this cup of juice. But the work that God does in this believer's heart by reminding me that it was this body broken for me and my sins, this blood that was shed for me and my sins, that creates a revival every time. And I would pray that you would experience that same revival today. This is something that God's given for his followers. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not a shame on you to not take this It's only a shame on you if you fake this. So don't come up here and take this because you feel like everybody else is. Only take this if you believe that Jesus' body was broken for you and your sins. 
that Jesus' blood was shed for you in your sins and that you are trusting that his sacrifice once and for all takes care of your salvation and leads you to him. That's what that table is for, and each of us has to examine ourselves before taking it. And so in this lead up to communion, this is what I had. The master's commendation to the manager. How does the master in the parable commend a man who has abused and violated him? You know what I'm saying? As the manager, we're, we're told he has abused the, he's abused his privilege of being a manager. He's violated the master's trust through how he's handled things, right? He's dishonest. How does the master then commend him for anything? Because I was thinking about this week, discussing with people in the groups I was in, and I said, if somebody takes my stuff, the natural man in me, if I've been wronged, is to be like, oh, no, you don't. It's not to be like, and you know, just to give you some positive criticism, some constructive criticism, no, it's, hey, we got problems, See you in court, whatever that is, right? That's the natural man. That's not what's coming out, guys. But that's the natural man in me. But the divine nature and what God does in our lives is this master's commendation. Even the master in the parable was able to say to this guy, hey, that was a pretty shrewd act. At least you used it to make some friends. They're going to be able to help you out when you leave this place. That guy could even give him some commendation. I want you to hear that, not because we're going to stay in that parable, because I want you to know Jesus is telling this, and he moves on. And we've seen the heart of God, like in last week's parable, right? In the Father, can we see it in the Master? I think the Master in this parable is not bothered because he's not concerned about his resources. He's rich. He just had a problem with this dude. I don't know what that's like. (laughs) He doesn't have a problem with this dude like I would have a problem with this dude because he has so many resources. I think. That's my opinion. None of that matters if it's true or not. Here's what I do want to tell you is true. God has so many resources. He is less concerned with what you've done before than he is right now with your heart, mind, and soul. And I know people can take that, run with it, and be like, that's not fair. That's not right. And you know if you sit around this preaching and teaching, you're going to hear so much more because it's the Bible. And Jesus has a lot to say about how sin has consequences. But if you're sitting here thinking, the master can't commend me at this table. God, Jesus, has already spoken and he said, it was my body broken in your place. It was my blood that was shed in your place. And that's what this is declaring to you and to me today. That we could receive that in faith and experience the joy of salvation that God gives because he is a God of unlimited resources and his chief concern is our hearts and souls of his children. So he's getting himself in this way. I want to invite the guys to come forward today that are going to help me serve communion. And uh, as I said, you are invited to be partaking of this with us. It is for those, it is for those who follow Jesus Christ, who trust in Jesus alone for salvation. You are invited to partake of that today. There are reasons to stay back and sit. We all go through those. So please don't feel that shame if you need to sit in place. And nobody should pressure anyone to come here and take of this table. Because here's the reason I experience joy. Nobody's making me take this table. I can't help but take this table. Guys, don't take it if you're not there. Don't take it if you don't believe what we said about Jesus. Examine yourself and ask God, God, I don't believe. Help my unbelief. And it's okay wherever you're at today. But I know that God won't leave you there. Through Jesus, he's achieving the ultimate rescue mission in our lives. And this is a reminder of that rescue mission today. You're invited to take this with us. It's just, it happens this way because this is confusing too. Some people, we take this different than some people. Piece of bread. When you get to the cup, dip it in the cup. Take it. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord, right? Go back to your chair. I, for many years in church services, would come up all somber, take it, walk back even more somber. (laughs) And that's okay, because some of us are going through somber stuff in life. But as a kid, I wasn't a somber dude. So it didn't match. So when you take this and you're not a somber dude, you probably shouldn't walk away somber. I'm going to walk away, Lord willing, rejoicing in what he's done you might see tears at times it might look somber 
but it's because he's moving my heart and my emotions to match the passion that he has showed to me and you. May you experience that today as you take this with us. You're invited to do that. Um, Everett will be dismissing pews as we go. Let me pray, and then we'll take this. Father God, I just uh, thank you for the privilege of communion. Thank you for the privilege of joining with the saints. God, we're not saints because of anything we've done. We're declared righteous because of your son, Jesus, and what he's done. That you call us saints and that I would reiterate this is a gathering of the saints is because of what Jesus has declared about us. You have identified us as saints simply because sacrificially you have shown your love completely through your son, Jesus Christ. As we take this today, may you bless us. May we see you making friends with us for eternity's sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, we're told that Jesus took the bread. And when he had broke it, he gave thanks and he said, this, this, this bread is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup and after he'd given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you to come take this with us.
you all stand with us as we sing and worship this last song? It's called Your Will Be Done. And uh, we were just talking about this song as a, as a group. Um, I love the message of this song. It's very, uh, it's the truth. You know, it is what Jesus said. You know, Father, in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Father, but yours be done, which is something very hard for us to do is to let his will be done in our lives. So I, I pray that this, the words of this song minister to you if there's any part of unwillingness in your heart that you will allow God to step in and allow his will to be done.
We've been so blessed by Jesus. Each of us has relational capital that God gives us. May we not waste that on any man-made cause or mission. May we use those things for God's eternal glory and for his kingdom forevermore. I wanna invite you to receive this benediction with me. Jesus' words, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also in dishonest in much. If then you, who have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Father, help us to be faithful to you first. We pray you will fulfill your rescue mission in this world with our full cooperation, with what we have, with all we have. And may you do it for your name and for the fame of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.